see how well we can keep on time. We got a party tonight. <laughs> uh, just two very quick announcements. If you have cell phones, would you please, please turn them off? For those of us who would like to really hear, we don't want the cell phones on. Also, your name tags. If you notice the little star on your name tag, that gets you into the party tonight. So remember your name tags tonight. All right? So welcome, welcome, <laughs> namaste. I think our first speaker is going to be a real treat for you. I'd like to introduce Scott Wolfgram from Minneapolis, and he's going to speak on geodetics. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kim Marie and Kristen for help putting this together and for Jeffrey. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for being here bright and early this morning. And I hope that all of you have had a cup of coffee today, hopefully two. That way it'll be harder for me to put you back to sleep. Um, at the same time, I hope we won't have a problem with that. The session this morning should be, I think, quite interesting. We're going to talk this morning about a form of astrology of location. We'll be dealing with geodetic mapping, cultural signatures, past lives, and uh, current events. And the goal for this morning is to provide some basic understanding of geodetics and to see how some of to see how geodetics can provide some unique insights into individuals and events uh, over the course of time. And maybe some of you will also be stimulated to looking at geodetics on your own. Now, before we get into the material, I want to give you a quick overview of the way the session is going to work this morning. We're going to start off with an introduction to the geodetic grid so that we can really get a firm understanding of what's the basis that we're going to be talking about this morning. Then we're going to look at geodetics in various cultures around the globe, and so we're going to take a little bit of a journey. Third, we're going to look at uh, geodetics and individuals and connections between past and present lives. And then finally, we're going to take a look at how geodetics uh, is, reveals the quality and location of world events. And as we go through the session, we're going to start off with basic principles, and we're going to gradually add things so we get into a more complete application of astrology by the we get, time we get to the end. Um, now, in your handouts, you should all have three pages from the session today. First, you're going to have a geodetic map of the world, and all these are going to be here as well on the site, but uh, there is a geodetic map of the world. Secondarily, you're going to have a map of the United States with some of the key planets we're going to be talking about today. And finally, a one-page summary of each of the planets and angles, so that as you're thinking about things, and if you think about where your own planets might be, you can start to work with the archetypes for the various planets and angles. Um, before we get started then, can I just ask for a show of hands of how many are relatively new to geodetics? It's pretty much everybody. <laughs> pretty much everybody, okay. <laughs> um, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to ask. If I don't see you right away, hang with me for a second. I'm not uh, quite ready for AARP like uh, Jeffrey and Steven are, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I have found out that um, I do need bifocals, and so if I'm going to take a peek at my notes, I have to take these off, so hang with me. It won't be long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get started with an introduction to the geodetic grid. So, as we think about geodetics, what we're really working with is a grid of lines that are wrapped around the Earth, representing the zodiac, wrapped around the Earth and placing them onto the Earth. And these are a set of fixed coordinates. And um, what I'd like to start off with is just take a look at the mechanics of how this grid is put together. So first, let's start with the geodetic midheaven lines. Um, in fact, let me back up for one thing. We have two sets of lines here. We have the midheaven lines, which are in red, and the ascendant lines, which are in yellow. And the starting place for this grid is at zero degrees of Aries, obviously starts the zodiac, and it's placed at Greenwich, England. 
And so this becomes the anchor for the geodetic grid. As we move on from there, if you move 30 degrees to the, to the east, you'll get to the zero degrees of Taurus Midheaven line, 30 degrees further, and you get on to Gemini, go all the way around the world, and we get to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean where you have zero degrees of Pisces in that region. London, England connects us at 29 degrees of Pisces and reconnects us back with Greenwich, England. So, once again, here are the, those are the mid-heaven lines. Now, there's also a set of ascendant lines. These are the yellow lines. These are curved lines. And um, some, they're curved at various different degrees. And the two lines that represent the equinoxes, the Aries line, which is here, and the Libra line, which is here, are almost vertical. They're almost, they're basically mirroring the uh, Capricorn and Cancer midheaven lines. Now when we look at the lines that are representative of the solstices, we have Capricorn here and Cancer, and these are the most curved lines, and they cross at the equator. They cross the Aries midheaven and the Libra midheaven lines at the equator. So what's important with these lines is to note that this is the grid that is the foundation for what we're going to talk about this morning. And when we put these together, we have a combination of midheaven and ascendant lines that create distinct regions. So here we have a region which is Pisces midheaven that comes this direction, and we have a Cancer ascendant. And so this whole region shares the quality of those two signs. And it's important to note that there's no other place on the globe that has these two signatures together. So each one of these regions is going to carry its own flavor and uh, its own distinct energy. And I like to refer to these as geodetic regions. Now, when we think about what we're going to, how we're going to apply these, we're going to apply these from the perspective of evolutionary astrology, which means that we're going to start off with the ascendant lines and think about them in terms of the instinctual manner of acting, how we act without forethought, and that this should flow through the regions of a particular ascendant. So each ascendant's region should have that kind of a characteristic to it. The midheaven lines should be representative of the social structures, norms, um, and uh, cultural taboos and so on within each given region. So as we put these together, the midheaven ascendant lines in the regions, and then think about the application of the ascendant in midheaven, what should happen is each one of these regions should, if the geodetic grid works, that the energy of the ascendant in midheaven should be reflective both of the land, the cultures, and the people that are living in, in the regions. And what we're going to start off with as we go through our tour of the world is to uh, see if we can see how the, those cultures are reflected there. Before we move on, are there any, any questions? Yes? Um, Scott, did you move back to your last uh, visual? Can you go back for a second? Yeah. You read that grid as being um, Pisces, Midheaven, and Cancer Ascendant. Yes. Why wouldn't you read it as Aries, Midheaven, Leo Ascendant? Um, one of the earlier slides we had noted that you start at, if you're at Aries, you're going to move to the east. So you're always going to move to the east, just as we would with the time zone. So you're going to say that from, from this region is Aries, Midheaven, this range is Taurus, Midheaven, and so on. And for the um, ascendant lines, it will be the space above it. So the line marks zero degrees, and then you're going to move forward and apply all the other degrees after that. Okay, um, yes? Who established the Greenwich Meridian in the first place? Is it arbitrary or...? Well, I, I think it is arbitrary and it's been a, a, a point of debate over time and different people have used different grids. I think the important thing from our perspective today and one of the things that we're going to look at is to see how effective this grid works and does it really reflect the world that we live in. And um, uh, they're just like um, different uh, house uh, methods and so on, there are going to be differences of opinion, but I think that you'll find that this works pretty effectively. Okay? Well, why don't we 
begin by taking a look at a trip around the globe and see if we can visit a number of different geodetic regions and see if this signature can be found in the cultures. So if we can move on. What we're going to do is because Greenwich, England is the place that starts the grid with zero degrees of Aries, we're going to start by talking about Europe. And um, pretty much you can see that with Europe being in this region here, we have a culture that is defined by two midheaven signs, the Aries this direction and the Pisces over here. And so let's start with that. And in fact, if we note that the five founding nations of the European Union, we had Germany, France, Italy, Belgium, and the Netherlands, they all had an Aries midheaven. So they all had a common approach to how to structure society. When we think about the nations to the east, the west of that line, we can see that with England, England, A, wasn't a founding member, but also they've still not chosen the euro as their set of, of currency. So even in, while they, in a general sense, share a, a set of heritage, there is a certain difference in approach in terms of how they look at social structures. And in fact, all of the nations here, England, Spain, and Portugal, were all later to join the European Union. And additionally, if you just think about their history, these three nations share uh, two interesting characteristics. They have both a Pisces midheaven and they have a Cancer ascendant. So this is a region where we have nations that have two water signs ruling them, both their ascendant and their midheaven. So the idea that these would be nations that would make their place in the world via mastery of the seas and their navies really makes sense compared to the nations uh, within the rest of the region. In fact, um, it's time to move on. <laughs> I didn't need the glasses after all. Let's move and let's take a look at the next region, the Taurus region. And what I'd like to do is focus for a second on the heart of the Islamic nations. And for our purposes, just real quickly, I'd like you to think about Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Iran. And here we have a really interesting combination of signatures because we have a Taurus midheaven, and again, that is going to flow this direction. And we also have a Leo ascendant. That ascendant line comes this way and, and up through here. So here we have two fixed signs. So here we should see cultures that are a little bit more resistant to change. Both Taurus is fixed, <laughs> Leo is fixed. It's great when just the normal stuff is funny. I like that. Uh, and, and if you think about there's a really, really interesting question here is which, what is it that they're fixed about? And with that Taurus midheaven, the values that they hold are very special to them. And those special values are what give them, Taurus, their fixed sense Leo of needing to feel special, as well as their desire not to have their values degraded, which will cause a sense of Leo humiliation. So, there we have just the generic picture for this region. What I'd like to do now is to move north and to take a look at an additional country of Turkey. And here we have an interesting scenario in that we have a nation that has this zero degrees of Taurus slicing through it. Would you be surprised that if you found, that if you started right here at zero degrees of Taurus and looked up, that you might find the Taurus Mountains. And yeah, the Taurus Mountains are in, are in Turkey and they start here and they proceed to the east. So the question that was asked a little bit earlier about, you know, does this zero degrees at Greenwich, England work? There are certain instances where it just sort of just is reflected naturally in the world that we're in. Well, let's take a look at Turkey just a little bit closer. Um, as you might be aware, there's a great debate going on right now in Turkey and within the European Union about Turkey's potential joining of the European Union. And uh, this is very interesting for the sense that Turkey's east, uh, western border here is at 26 degrees of Aries. And at the same time, it proceeds all the way to 15 degrees of Taurus. So it has a mixed midheaven. It has two different cultural signatures. And 
right about at this time, if you look at the news coming out of Europe, day after day you're hearing, is Turkey really a European Union? And so what geodetics tells us is that it's reflective of what's going on in the world. The question that Europe is asking is, does this little slice here suggest that they are going to be able to connect well with the European Union, or are they really much more connected with this Taurus region and the heart of the Islamic countries? Now, what we don't know is what the ultimate response and ultimate outcome is going to be from just this look. But what I can tell you is this. All of the member nations and all of the candidate nations, if you put them all together, no country in that group has a border that crosses zero degrees of Taurus. So in effect, Turkey is a great big test case for that. Okay? Let's move north and take a look at another interesting nation that's been in the news lately and look at the Ukraine, which is also split between this uh, Aries and Taurus Midheaven. Um, when uh, the Ukraine was under communist domination, all of the cultural distinctions were sort of repressed and kept down. Now free from communism, all of a sudden these cultural uh, differences are springing up and they've really become clear in this most recent election. So October 26th, they ha oh, excuse me, one thing I wanted to mention first. If you look at the split basically runs right along this line and to the eastern side, which includes Kiev, the nation has the following characteristics. They're Russian speaking, they're orthodox religious, and politically they lean towards Moscow which is right here with the same geodetic signature. Alternatively, the west side is Ukrainian speaking, totally different language. They're Catholic in their religious uh, beliefs, and once again, then they lean towards Europe. So the cultures that split along this line completely and accurately reflect what's going on in the geodetic grid. So October 26th, 2004, they held an election and then in November, they certified that election. And on that election, it was determined that the Eastern candidate won. By the way, on the day of the election, the sun was running over Moscow geodetically that day. So it looked like uh, the East was the winner there. There were some discrepancies about the election. I think I could be fair in saying that. A little bit of protest in the streets. So in December, they held a new election, and in January, they certified that election. And in that election, of course, the Western candidate won. Would it surprise you that the one single major difference, geodetically, is that for the first election and certification, the transiting north node of one's destiny was at two and one degrees of Taurus, and because the nodes move retrograde, when they got through and did the next election, it had moved to 29, 28, and 27 of Aries. So once again, geodetics reflects what's going on in the world in a very clear and direct way. Let's continue our travels, and let's take a look at the country of India. And India is really an interesting country. It has a Gemini midheaven and a... Virgo ascendant. And first, let's look at some of the real generic applications of the Gemini Midheaven. It's really interesting. Gemini rules speech and language. Would it surprise you to know that India is the land of multiple Gemini languages? There are 18 languages that are official languages in India. Schools are taught in over 50 languages, and newspapers are printed in over 80 different languages. Additionally, Sanskrit, which is basically it's not the first language, but at the beginning of basically the, all the Indo-European languages is the home was created here in India. So we also see that India's status within the world is based on language and that of the Sanskrit language. So if we move then to the ascendant line, this is really interesting and this plays out in America real clearly. The people in India have a very analytic mind. They have a, just a natural way of being able to brace embrace logic. Today, if for people that have seen the technology industry, we know that we're imp importing thousands and thousands of Indians with this great ability to do programming because they have this logical mind. It's naturally a part of them. We're importing them. And at the same time, Virgo also rules the archetype of service. 
And if we combine the archetype of Virgo service with speaking here, would it be a surprise that we're also offshoring our call center work to India? So once again, sometimes geodetics takes place where it is, and sometimes it comes to us. Now, at this point, I want to introduce a new concept, something that's not on the map. And this is that when you have a birth chart, you have, for every midheaven, there's an IC, and whenever there is an ascendant, there's a descendant. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the IC for India. And so with a Gemini midheaven, we can come down to the IC and see that we have a Sagittarius IC. The IC, this is reflective of our roots, our heritage, and how we look at ourselves. And so in this regard, what we see is that Sagittarius rules religion and philosophy. So is it a surprise that here we have the home of religious philosophies in India, both in terms of just straight out philosophies, but also of religions? So here you have a home, uh, a country whose home is based on, we have Hinduism, Buddhism, Sufis, Islam, uh, Jains, Zoroastrians, Sikhs, even Christians. Mother Teresa is famous for her work here. Many of us, including myself, feel that Jesus spent a number of his lost years in India mastering his own personal path. And then finally, and this was, this was really interesting, we were just over in Europe and we had a chance to see um, statues of St. Thomas. And St. Thomas was the apostle that was sent to do his missionary work in India. And the images of St. Thomas are twofold. One is the popularized version where he's touching the wound of Christ because he's doubting Thomas. He does not have faith. Why doesn't he have faith? Because he embraces a logical uh, picture of the world. What is, how is that? Is that he's also pictured with a T-square, which reflects this need for an analytic approach, a systematic approach, a more enlightened approach to spirituality. So once again, these images keep coming from the geodetic signatures and get reflected around the world. Let's, let's move forward and take a quick look at China. And we're going to do these next couple really quick. But here we have the nation which is directly opposite the United States, which you'll see a little bit later. They have a Cancer Midheaven and a Libra Ascendant. With this Cancer uh, Midheaven, this is a, a culture that is really concerned with its security. It needs to protect itself. And with this Libra ascendant, we know that for the last 50 years or so, roughly, China has been communist. And so we have this ideal of balance and communism. We know that that doesn't mean that that's the way it really is, but that's where the archetype is. Additionally, because you have the Cancer Midheaven, you also have a Capricorn IC. So you can see that family life here might be hard. Family planning. No flexibility there. It's rigid, it's enshrined, it's within the culture. So let's move over to take one look at one last region, and here we have a Leo Midheaven and a Scorpio Ascendant. And if we first of all would say that with this Scorpio Ascendant, we have North Korea and Tokyo, and uh, excuse me, Japan, and that here we have two relatively, relatively closed countries, North Korea being perhaps one of the most of all closed in the entire world. Uh, Japan was very closed for a long time, and still from a number of perspectives, it's closed today. And at the same time, both of these nations have a societal need to be intensely proud. And in fact, Japan has the symbol of the rising sun on its national flag, which is the archetype of Leo. So, are there any questions? This is just designed to give you a quick sense of how you can start applying these archetypes and how you can see them in the ground. Because what we're going to do is we're going to start deepening things a little bit now when we look at the United States. Now, so far, we've limited our discussion to nations and cultures that have a common ancestral heritage. And by that, what I mean is that people in Germany are primarily of German descent. People from Japan are primarily of Japanese descent. When we come to the United States, we have an interesting influence in that this is a nation of immigrants. Everybody that is part of the main portion of society, leaving, of, leaving the American Indians uh, aside for a second, the main bulk of, of the culture today came from somewhere else one, two, three hundred years ago. 
So this actually brings up an interesting test case for geodetics. And that's this. Did the people that migrated from Europe and settled here and created cultures here, did they build them with the structures from where they came from? Or did they build them in relation to the geodetic signatures where they are living today and where they built their cultures? So let's keep that in mind as we go through some of these um, uh, regions. Now the, United, now, the United States has seven distinct geodetic regions. We are not going to talk about all of them today. We have so much good stuff to get through. So what we're going to do today is to note the next issue here, which is what we are going to focus on is the placement of natal planets. The other thing that's interesting about the United States is that it is one of the first nations to have a birth chart. And so it was intentionally created. And so we also have planetary lines that we're going to work with. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just focus our attention on a couple of the planetary lines and see how they influence, deepen, and clarify the uh, regional uh, differences within, um, uh, within the geodetic regions. So when we look at planetary lines, we're going to expand our, our look a little bit. And I just want to really quickly note that we're going to have wherever there is an ascendant, there's going to be a descendant. And wherever there's a midheaven, there's going to be an IC. The ascendant and descendant lines will be yellow. The IC and midheaven lines will be red. Once again, the ascendant, instinctual manner of acting, midheaven, tradition, social norms, social status, descendant, relationships, how we interact with others, and then IC, emotional roots, ego, and our heritage. Okay. Let's begin our tour with the United States. And let's look at the natal sun, which is at 13 degrees of cancer in the natal chart. Now, whenever you have, take a planet and put it into the geodetic grid, we have to re recall that 13 of cancer is going to occur at four places on the chart, but there's only two places where cancer is on the grid. So this 13 of cancer also relates to an IC of 13 of Capricorn, which is uh, where the sun line is. Incidentally, that runs directly through Washington, D.C. So our sun sense of purpose with the IC roots and heritage run directly through Washington, D.C. So the question is, once again, is this planned? Were the Masons involved? <laughs> Sibley was a Mason from the Sibley chart. He was a Mason. Uh, I don't know if it was that. Well, you know, perhaps. Heck, that's a topic for another day. Uh, maybe it's not. Maybe it's time topic for the next Dan Brown book, um, which, in fact, if you, he is going to be speaking on the founding of our country, and so I'm betting he's going to get into some of this stuff. Okay. Let's move on and continue our tour of the United States, and we're going to look at the region that has a Capricorn midheaven and an Aries ascendant. So that region basically starts at New York, which is at 29 degrees of Aries, and it's going to come this way. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at two distinct cultures. At least I kind of feel they're two distinct cultures, and I think most of us would agree that the Midwest and the South, while they share a geodetic signature of Capricorn and Aries, that they have a bit of a different cultural perspective. And what we're going to try to do is do two things. We're going to attempt to answer what the differences in their signatures are using the same archetypes. And then secondly, we're going to try to explain why it happens. Why are they different even though they have this similar uh, signature? So first, let's do a real quick application of this Capricorn Aries to the Midwest. So you have New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, some of Wisconsin and Illinois. And this was traditionally in America where our industry was created. This is where we had big machinery and uh, industries. And so Aries rules machinery and iron. Capricorn rules industrialists. And with these two signatures, there should be no surprise that there's a lot of hard work that goes on here. Now, things change over time. And uh, in the 70s and 80s, this region took on a new name. It was called the Rust Belt. And it should be no surprise that Aries rules rust and Saturn rules corrosion. S Capricorn rules corrosion. So once again, over time, the same signatures seem to apply. 
So let's take a look now at the South. And the South, as I was thinking about this, and I'm going to try to be fair, um, but the South <laughs> takes the same Capricorn and is very connected to its tradition. It's tradition bound. You could say there's a sense of inertia. And when you think about the founding of the country, Capricorn also rules slavery. Now, the Aries ascendant also is reflective here of a rebel, of a need to have nobody tell me what to do. So the image of Johnny Reb defending his traditions is something that seems to fit here. Now, to be fair to the South, once again, wherever you have an Aries ascendant, you have the polarity, you have a Libra descendant. So this is a very genteel society. They have a very generous approach to relationships, a very warm approach. And so this is also a very important part of this region. So it's not all, it's not all heavy. But when I looked at this sense of tradition, I was, I was sitting back and saying, you know, but you know, the Civil War was 140 years ago, and has, haven't things changed? Well, if we've been looking at the news lately, we know that we're still dealing with, do we want to have the Confederate flag posted in one form or another? Do we want to post monuments to our good old time religion and so on? So this tradition is still, um, still there. And in fact, this need to resist, last Sunday in the New York Times, there was a book review of a book that was titled The Confederate Battle Flag. And the writer posed an unanswered question. And I put two sentences together to make it short, but it goes like this. Why are so many Southerners with their nobody can tell us what to do, Aries, uh, attitude, so irrationally invested in their maintaining their regional mythology, mythology, Capricorn. And instantly when this happened, I was taken back um, to my early teenage years, which are always important for people, and I was sitting back, it instantly took me back to Neil Young. And I don't know how many of you know the song, Southern Man, but this is a great song, Southern Man, Better Keep Your Head, don't forget what your good book said. Southern change is going to come at last, and now your crosses are burning fast. Well, there was a movie that came out a couple years ago called Sweet Home Alabama that really had its roots in Neil Young's song because Leonard Skinner wrote a direct reply to that song. They said, we heard old Neil talk about her, but we don't need her, him putting her down. We hope Neil Young will remember. Southern man don't need him around anyhow. And then Charlie Daniels, a year and a half later... <laughs> No, this is, this is really great when this happens because he wrote a song where he said, you can be a rebel here and you can be proud. You can be proud you're a rebel because the South's going to do it again and again and again. He kept on saying it, the South's going to do it again. So this is, a, this is going to continue on within this region. So one of the ways that we can look at determining why this is, why cultures are the way they are, is to put the planets in. So here, is anybody getting a headache from that? I hope not. That was not the intention. Here is the Saturn descendant line, and this planetary line contains the answer, in my opinion, to why the South is the way that it is, so tradition-bound. And at the first glance, I looked at it and I said, well, you know, it runs through Detroit, runs through Michigan, they're, they're a little tradition-bound too, but it doesn't affect the region the way it does down here. And so, as I was poking around, I was initially quite perplexed, and what that led to was the need to do a little bit of both historic and astrological detective work. And what I found out was that the answer can be found within the Saturn line, but not in the current map. In fact, that was the secret. I was looking at the wrong map. So let's flash up the next map, and here we have the original 13 colonies. Remember, the United States was created and has a birth chart. These are the original 13 colonies. Not Florida down here, that was Spanish at the time, but here they are. They all look a little bit different because the nation wasn't formed quite the same way. Now let's spin that planetary line in and note something very interesting. Isn't technology great? Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia are the states that this Saturn line crosses through. So, in a sense, what this planetary line does is it energizes this Capricorn region. This is a Capricorn region all the way through here, but only the southern states have this energizing and really intensifying that energy so that 
as the nation expanded to the west and came this way, the states that were connected here and to the west and south, those were the countries that, uh, the countries, those were the states that joined the Confederacy in seceding from the Union that led to the Civil War. So, does that make sense how that plays out? Okay, let's real quickly move through another couple of signatures. And what we're going to do now is take a look at natal Neptune. It is at 22 of Virgo in the birth chart of the nation, which means it's at geodetic descent. It is 22 of Pisces. So if we can pop that in, what we can find is, is that Pisces rules both dreamers, delusions, and oil. And so isn't it interesting that this line comes right here through Houston, energizing this region. And this is, by the way, excuse me, this is the Sagittarius Midheaven region and the Pisces Ascendant region. Now what I want to do is take a real quick shot up to the north. This is America's farmland, this region. Once again, a Pisces Ascendant, compassion for others. But why does it reflect the way that it does? Natal series is at eight degrees of Pisces, and so the ascendant nature here takes this series is affiliated with grain, the harvest, and providing for nurturing others. So here we see, and it also is where we get our word cereal from, so here we see that this is where we become the breadbasket to the world. Now what we're going to do is look at one last region, and this is going to be where we have still a Sagittarius midheaven, but now we're going to come into the region that has a Uran on an Aquarius ascendant. And this is kind of interesting because this whole region through here, Montana, Wyoming, uh, Idaho, this is, this is like cowboy country. You know, this is the home of the big sky. And in fact, Uranus and Aquarius rules Father Scott. Uranus was Father Sky. Sagittarius would suggest that we want the, everything to grow and to be big. It doesn't surprise us that we have the big sky state in Montana. We didn't get that signal right. I'm sorry, let me do it. Next time we get the signals, we'll go like this, and then we'll get our signals right. We won't get things coming in, in early. Um, we also have the Uranus IC line running through here. And this really intensifies this region in that the home life is somewhat unsettled. It's not easy. It's always changing and movable. And at the same time, it also energizes this region to say, leave me alone. Leave my home alone. So it takes that desire for freedom and, and the wide open spaces and it intensifies that. Okay? Are there any questions at this point? Yes. Um, I'm trying to understand how you get the, uh, the angle when you take the planet and, you, and you're looking at a different zodiac uh, sign, like the opposite sign. Sure. Because the, the sun I see was Washington, right? And yes. And Saturn descendant was the south. And how does the angle get, how, yeah, how does that happen? That's a really great question, and I apologize for not going through that quite as, as fully as maybe I should have. When, when you think about the polarities, and I'll just use this line here, Wherever you have zero degrees of Capricorn, because, let me start back here. On the geodetic grid, we have midheaven lines and we have ascendant lines. But planets have four lines. And for wherever there is a midheaven line, there's also an IC line that's in the opposite sign. So as an example, at 13 degrees of, can of uh, Capricorn, on the midheaven section right here, that also translates to the polarity. So what happens is, as, an, as, an, as a, um, an example, that sun line at 13 degrees of Cancer will, ap will appear in four places. It appears in, th in 13 of Cancer as a midheaven. That would put it in China. Remember that China has that, that Cancer midheaven. It, there, but the, at the opposite point on the Earth, here in the Capricorn midheaven, it's the IC. So it will naturally slot in at both of those places. Now, with the ascendant line here of Aries, you also have for each one the, uh, the uh, polarity sign in the descendant. So for the grid, you're always looking at a midheaven and an ascendant, and when you put a planet in, if you're just doing it by head, you have to use the midheaven and the ascendant for these signs, and then the polarity signs, and you'll, so the planet will fit in and fall place, four places. Does that help? Yes? Ascendant, does that show a shift from iron to gold and does that describe the gold rush? 
in the West Coast? You know, if you want to, you can sit around and play with this and you can find seven million correlations. You're absolutely right. There's a lot of things you can do with this. And the whole purpose for this, this section is to A, show you how it works and to help you to start doing that thought because that's where we can all sort of take our individual interests and expand our, our understanding here. Yes? Uh, um, so with the ascendant, um, well, I, I guess I don't quite understand all the ascendants. So the East Coast, like in New England, it would have a Gemini ascendant with an Aquarius midheaven or here. would it have a Taurus ascendant with Aquarius midheaven? Let's start here and just say that the midheaven line here the midheaven is always this direction is going to be for the right for the United States in Capricorn. All of the country has a Capricorn midheaven east of the Mississippi River. From an ascendant perspective, from an ascendant perspective, the Aries starts here and comes all the way to this line here. So this region is Capricorn midheaven, Aries ascendant, and the New England is Capricorn midheaven and Taurus ascendant. And so you always, and so it's, in, so it's like, it, you can look at each of these regions and say, yes, this region does act a little bit differently from this region does. And, and does that help? Yeah, I thought you had said that through New York it was 29 degrees. Of New York is just to the west of the Taurus line. Oh, okay. So if you start here at zero degrees of Aries and you march, you're going to get 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 29, and then you go another degree and you get to Taurus. Yeah, thank you. Okay? Yes. Is there a kind of software that's good for looking at this? I have Solar Maps, which does some of it. I can I just looked up, but I I uh, use uh, the Kepler software, and it will put in both the planetary lines, and it will also put in a, a a grid of all the lines. So if you're looking for a particular city, you can type in Sedona, Arizona, and uh, it'll pull up the map for that, and put it on the map, and you'll be able to see the lines. You'll be able to get a pretty good crosshair of it. Okay. Okay, now that we've completed our journey around the globe, let's take a look at individuals and see what we can understand about individuals in both their past and present lives through the use of geodetics. And in a real general sense, there's some, geodetics is about the ground. It's about what's in the earth. These lines are fixed and they're in the ground, but our planetary lines are individual. And so on one level, the geodetic planetary lines seem to represent a place where in a, an individual has been before, almost like they've been making a magnetic connection that then translates along these lines across the globe. So in a sense, these lines for individuals will reflect two things. I think you, we're going to look at both planetary lines here and geodetic resonance, excuse me, I got a little bit ahead of myself. And these are the two techniques that we're going to use in terms of looking at individuals. So why don't we try this again? So the geodetic lines of the planets reflect, in my mind, two things. They reflect where the past life energies have been connected with the Earth. And at the same time, they also have a tendency to reflect locations for actions in the current life. And hopefully what we're going to be able to do is follow some of these lines with key individuals and see how that has taken place over time. Now the second idea that we're going to work with is that of geodetic resonance. And this is going to be a tool where when you're in any geodetic region, there is a, there's an, a midheaven line and an ascendant line. So that signature of midheaven and ascendant rules a region. At the same time, everybody has a birth chart, and they have an ascendant and a midheaven on that birth chart. And so geodetic resonance suggests to us that when my midheaven is the same sign, in the same sign as that of a region, that my approach to cultural and social norms is going to be in sync with the social and cultural norms of the region. And that when my ascendant is in the same sign, as the geodetic region. My instinctual manner of acting is the same as that region. So there is a cultural fit. You seem to fit, sink right in. You fit right in. There's no conflicts there. So these are the two different techniques that we're going to use. And I think you're going to see that they have some really fascinating uh, connections. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a look at three, start off by looking at three of the most influential Americans and that took part in a tremendous experiment when they founded the United States. 
This was the first huge change in social structure in a long, long time. And it was replacing merit, uh, excuse me, aristocracy with the concept of democracy. So what we want to do is look at these individuals, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Ben Franklin, and see where they might have gotten these ideas from, and then also to see how geodetics plays out in both that past and in the future. So let's take a look at George Washington. And the two, first let's look at his past life connections. And first, he has a Pluto IC running right between Greece and Rome. And roughly 2,000 years ago, this was the part of the world and the two cultures that founded the idea of modern democracy. And so he has the IC, his sense of roots and heritage, are located right in this region. And we can also see that George Washington might have had connections to individuals with interesting ideas because he's got the Mercury descendant line, ideas and relationships connected here. So this is what he brings with him into the current life from the past. But let's look at real quickly at his life in the United States. And I really have just one question for George Washington. How does a southerner, we, we've seen the split between the nation, how does a southerner become the father of the nation? And there's two simple answers and they're both shown in geodetics. First is the position of his natal moon. He's got his moon in Capricorn and it runs directly through New England. This is the Midheaven line. Moon is where you're known for and when, you're, and, and when it's on the Midheaven, you can become the father of the nation through this line and it runs through the north and through New England, that's important because the south would have accepted him anyway. But this is what energized his ability to connect with the north. Now at the same time, he also shares the idea of geodetic resonance. And we have noted just a minute ago that New England has a Capricorn midheaven and a Taurus ascendant, and so does George Washington. So he fits right in and the people accept him and back and forth. So you can see that there's just a natural fit for him there. Let's move on to the next one and let's take a look at Thomas Jefferson. Author of the Declaration of Independence, president, I mean he did a lot of things. Uh, and he's also known for his home in Monticello. So let's take a look at Thomas Jefferson's past. And first we have two things. We have this sun midheaven, and uh, that runs, sure, it runs right through uh, Greece. And so here we see sun midheaven, social honor midheaven through purpose and destiny, sun. He also has another important line, the Uranus descendant line running right off the coast of Rome and the Roman Empire. So here we have past energy again coming from this region, and here we have revolutionary relationships coming with him. So this is the, what he drags with him from the past. By the way, something's very interesting about Rome and that Rome started off with the idea of having a democracy, but they, also, but they ultimately changed and they dropped that in favor of emperors. And it's interesting that Thomas Jefferson drags this idea along that we, he really wanted to have continuous revolution so we didn't get caught up in the reappointing of emperors as leaders. It might have some application to our world today here in America. <laughs> well, let's look at Thomas Jefferson's life and what he's most noted for, and that is for the Declaration of Independence. Would it make sense to you that right here crossing through England we have that same Uranus descendant line crossing Mercury midheaven. Does that not sound like revolutionary ideas, revolutionary writing for which he would become famous, and Uranus exploding the ties between the colonies and the crown? Let's look at him in the United States. And here we have one really important line. He has his son ascendant line running through Washington, D.C., and right outside his home in Monticello. So here he's naturally known. He has attend, uh, the ability to succeed and have honor. And it's interesting because this home of Monticello, today it's on the back of our nickel. We really relate that to him. And that came from 
right outside here. It's modeled after a home in Italy right outside of Venice. So he's taken his energy from this region and brought it back to the United States in multiple different ways. Yes? Are you using the descendant lines as the past life connections? I think I'm using them all as past life connections in one way or another. The descendant line relates to relationships. And so what you'll find is there's some connection with relationships and what we either have, who we've known, or what we've projected onto others. There's a lot of different applications there, but yes? Is there a geodetic correlation to past lives, or are you using Europe as the past simply because these people came from there and moved to the U.S.? In this case, I'm doing it for one particular reason, which is these three people who have worked with this experiment here in the United States all came with, with, with the idea from somewhere. And that came from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Now, it's interesting because when you look at this, these lines go everywhere all over the globe. And at a certain point, you can suggest that somebody was from everywhere at every point in time. And I don't have the key to unlock that exact formula yet. Maybe someday Jeffrey will help us figure out what that is. <laughs> um, but what has become clear to me is that the, these lines are reflective of either our past or our present in some way, especially when they're active with what we're involved with. Now, one of the neat things about geodetics uh, is this. The outer planets move very slowly. So what you very often have is, is that for a decade at a time, a particular planet can be in one location. So what you can see is that there's sort of a generational wave sort of implication to some of this. And what you'll find is, is that this energy seems to be coming from the outer planets, from the people that energized the United States and, that, uh, and, and the revolution there. Not everybody is doing it, however, because we're all at different evolutionary stages. We all have different birth charts. What geodetics can really do is just help us pinpoint things that when we look at the rest of the context that we're working with, birth chart, evolutionary stage, and so on, we can try to put a picture together. Let's move on and take a look at Ben Franklin. And this is an interesting guy because he's known for a few things, but he did just about everything. Self-made man, revolutionary brother. He, by the way, edited the Declaration of Independence, uh, inventor, ambassador. Let's take a look at his most important energies. And let's start off with the fact that, once again, he has energy here in this same region. He has the Uranus ascendant line. So here he has an instinctual need to want to be a revolutionary that he brings with him. In addition to that, he has two very interesting lines. He has a Sun line and a Neptune Midheaven line that he brings from Rome. And to me, this is really interesting because this Neptune on the Midheaven suggests ideals for social status. And if we look at all the founding brothers, he was one of them that had some of the most progressive and most idealistic goals for the Declaration of Independence and for our Constitution, which were not all embraced because he was too ideal for the rest of the nation. And we can see how that comes from his past. So let's move on and take a look at his work for the United States. After the revolution started, he went to France and he was our ambassador to France. And should it be surprising that he has a Jupiter and Sun line running on either side of Paris. Here we have opportunities for success with the Jupiter line and then we have honor through diplomacy with the Sun line. And if you think about what his real contribution to the revolution was is that he got the, f got the French to pay to give us almost all of our guns, really all of our gunpowder. And at the decisive battle of Yorktown, people don't remember this, but the French had basically 50% of the soldiers there. Why were they there? Because he was able to utilize these lines to be a spectacular diplomat. Now, the second president of the United States, Sam Adams, was also there, and he had no success whatsoever. They hated him. But the, the, these planetary lines of Ben Franklin allowed him to really energize and be able to succeed. So let's move across the sea and look at his life in the United States. And here we have a Neptune ascendant line. Is it surprising to us that in the United States his true identity is somewhat foggy? 
we can sort of project different images onto him. What, you know, so we, we look at his legacy. And it's interesting to note that he isn't known really for being an inventor. I mean, I need the bifocals that he invented. But we don't think about that. What do we think of him for? And that really relates to this next chart, and that's this. He has Venus on the midheaven in Capricorn. And once again, the United States on the eastern half of the country has a Capricorn midheaven. So he becomes known for a man of Capricorn, practical Venus values. A penny saved is a penny earned and all that sort of stuff. Even today, Franklin Covey used his name and they bring him into the seven habits and all that stuff. So this is what he becomes known for and that gets projected onto him via that Neptune uh, ascendant line. Why don't we move on and take a look at two modern presidents. Yes? How wide of a uh, orb would they have in an influence? I mean, is that just that segment of the country or would it involve the whole country? Well, I think that, you know, that really depends. If you're thinking about an individual's, the question was how, how broad of an orb do you give to these lines? And for myself, in a, for an individual, I use orbs of just one or two degrees. And obviously, the tighter the orb is, the more, the more impact we're going to have. When we're looking at resonance with a region, we're here with uh, Ben Franklin. We have a, the issue of resonance with an entire region. I think that you can sometimes, you know, you're combining symbols. You might open that up a little bit. But for the most part, uh, I really try to keep a fairly tight orb. And I think that for the most part, that you can use that uh, pretty effectively. Yes? So would you say Washington? Line was also close enough to New York since New York was the first capital of the United States? Well, I was, I was thinking of it just in the sense that he needed to be accepted by New England. And he had his moon mid-heaven line running through New England. That, really, that was less to do with New York right. than to right. do just with New England. Giving a, another overlay of that. Uh, you could, and, and again, you know, you can go into this in de as deeply as you'd like. If you start... The deeper you get into it, the more things you can bring in. What our goal for today is, is really to just sort of pick out the highlights and to see how they continue to reflect. And then as you go back on, it would be great, you know, if we could have come back a year from now and have all kinds of discussions about uh, particular issues. I think that would be fun. Let's take a look at Ronald Reagan, and I'm going to really quickly whiz through our Teflon president who was very successful, by the way, very successful. I want to look at first uh, two lines that reflect something important. Here his son, Ascendant Line, runs through Los Angeles. He becomes a star in the movies in Los Angeles. His Saturn Midheaven Line runs along the East Coast here, and it energizes his ability to be the president and leader of the world. But, and I did widen that out just a little bit, um, but now, Let's add something for presidents. Presidents reflect the country. And if presidents reflect the country as the leader of the country, let's ask the question, real simple one. Where do presidents go to war? Mars. And would it make sense that if we came to the top and said, here we have Mars midheaven and drew that line straight down, it goes directly through Managua and Nicaragua. So here is his desire to fight war and to wage it through the Nicaraguan Contras. But he's not really known for that. That's where he waged war. But what is he known for? He's known for bringing down the Soviet empire by calling them an evil empire. So if we look over here, we see Moscow. And on either side, we see the Saturn Midheaven asserting his authority. Moon Midheaven, what I'll be known for. North Node Midheaven, part of his destiny. And here's the key. Jupiter on the IC, he's going to make nice with them while he's doing it. And so he never went to war with Russia, but it was still his intention and his destiny and what he would become known for to be able to make it happen with that moon and midheaven there. So in a sense, what he did was he used a number of surrogates to get it done. And I'm just going to point out very quickly that this same set of lines 
is going to run through Baghdad, which will become important for him. So his destiny and what he is known for should run through there. And he has a Venus descendant line running on the border between Iran and Afghanistan, suggesting friendly relationships. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some transits a little bit later on. Uh, but right now we're going to move on our and vote President George Bush. And, you know, it's very easy for us to want to get, um, to hone in on some of the negatives in a crowd like this. But I want you to know that when you look at his chart, very important, oh, let me start with the past. He has the same region here that we looked at before with the other presidents. He has a lot of stuff going on. Jupiter moon on the IC reflects a place of security and comfort and a place where he would Saturn Ascendant be able to assert his authority. Now what about his destiny in this life? Real quickly, with the Uranus IC line, North Node Midheaven line, both running through the center of Texas, this is where he breaks free from himself being the black sheep of the family. You know, he had a rough first half of his life and he was not very successful, but he did break free from his past and he was able to assert his destiny through his work here. And then finally, because his son is at the same degree as the nation, he, his son line runs through Washington, D.C., and he very clearly connects himself with the mission and history and security of the nation. Okay? Let's move on and talk about world events. And now what we're going to try to do is use geodetics to explain the location and the quality of world events. And what we're going to do is... I am going to start with a political disclaimer here. <laughs> My guess, there's a lot of laughter, so I'm assuming that I know where most of the group here is in the political spectrum, but people will be here from all parts of the spectrum, and I am not intending to make any grand political statements today. What I am trying to do is to suggest that we're going to look at the unintended results of our kar karmic results of our actions. I am not attempting to impugn the character or the intentions of any of the individuals. No, no, come on, let's take a look. Let's, ah, oh, what the heck? What the heck? It's coming out next month. Isn't it like the perfect title? Okay. Um, all the events that we're going to talk about have an ish, an element that reflects this idea of the Sith. And um, very good question. The Sith is uh, the evil emperor and Darth Vader. That's who they are. Some people that aren't Star Wars fans are. I'm sorry, my, I apologize. Um, and what we're going to look at is we're going to connect this in a particular way in just one minute. But first, I want to note mm -hmm, that um, this is, I didn't do this. I didn't do this, but this is important. This is in our culture. This is what is being asked of us. This is a cover from The Nation magazine, uh, and this is our friend Huey from the Boondocks. And somebody has implied that there is a connection from Star Wars and the Sith to two of the most important people on the world stage today, George Bush and Osama bin Laden. Now, what I'd like to do is, is to look at a number of events from the perspective of our nation's karma, and the perpetuation of evil. And what I want to do is start off with um, talking about the idea, we're going to in, in interject the idea of Lucifer into this particular part of, the, of the, the, the talk. And I'm going to give you a quick overview, but I do want to give a quick plug. This is going to be very quick and very gross what I'm going to do, but there's a really great uh, set of CDs in the back of a, of a, of a conversation between Kim Marie, Adina Mather and Rose Marcus about Lucifer. And if you find this interesting, this uh, CD is available here. So, okay. Where am I here? Okay, so let's hit the next one. L Lucifer, the way I'm going to look at it, is attempting to continue and perpetuate evil. And the way that it will do this is through energizing fear and hatred. And how will it do that? It will do that through, if you can do one more, continuing to apply good versus evil. 
And one of the things that these two individuals have done on either side of Darth Vader is they have called themselves good and called the other evil. And in a sense, they're symbiotic, which is what the Sith are. They work in a symbiotic relationship. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at how this work between good and evil has actually strengthened evil and how it has created continuous karma for the nation. Okay, the landmark perhaps event of the 20th century was the bombing of Hiroshima by the United States and geodetics provides an exact location for where it took place. On the day of the bombing, Pluto Midheaven conjunct the Sun Midheaven running on either side of Hiroshima with the United States progressed moon directly passing over Hiroshima, splitting that crosshairs. Now, if anybody wants to try and duplicate this, I use Rudyard's chart with a 5.14 p.m. Uh, birth time for the nation for this. And I think when you look at this, uh, you can use some people, I'm not saying there's one, one birth chart um, for the nation per se. Uh, you can use sometimes geodetics to validate whether it works or not. Here it does seem to work. So let's take a look now that we have the crosshairs, let's take a look at the quality of the event. Okay. We have four, a couple of wheels here. We have the natal wheel, we have the solar return wheel in 1945 for the US chart, and then outside we have the transit at the time of the bombing. And first of all, what I want to talk about is these two progressions. The progressed moon, uh, Mars just hit the midheaven, conjuncted natal, uh, transiting Neptune. So th that's hard to be clear exactly about where your intentions are, particularly for your sense of status for the nation. At the same time, the progressed moon is exactly square the nodes, suggesting that here we have a crisis in terms of our security. If we can go to the next one. Now when we get to the solar return, we see that we have Saturn conjunct the sun. We have a test of our authority, squaring and, and a question of our beliefs with our social structures. And now here it gets kind of interesting. Solar return 1945, Lucifer is conjunct Neptune. And at the time of the bombing, Mars conjuncted that Lucifer in the solar return chart in here. And where do you think natal Lucifer, or transiting Lucifer was at the time of the bombing? Directly conjunct Mars. So here you can see that we thought that we were trying to make the world more secure when instead we perpetuated evil and a whole lot of time worrying about the Cold War and nuclear proliferation. 29 years later, on the next Saturn conjunct the Sun, we left Vietnam. So here you have Saturn IC, 13 degrees of Cancer, heaviness in Washington for the nation, and who at the opposite end of the world was in the place of status? Vietnam and China. So there's that karmic reflection 29 years later, so you can see how these cycles work. Let's see what we can get to here. Now, Ronald Reagan, evil empire speech. This is what he's known for. During this entire time leading up to this, he has Pluto descendant running over and through Washington. So prior to this, it was over in this range and directly over that. This suggests he's projecting the shadow of evil outward onto others, seventh house. He gave the speech in Orlando, Florida, down here. And at that time, of the speech, the moon midheaven was over that place and so was Venus ascendant. And one thing we know about Ronald Reagan was he used astrology to time his speeches for maximum effectiveness. I'm not sure that they use geodetics, but this is a spectacular example of how he gets well-received Venus and well-known for making the speech about the evil empire. Let's take a quick look at the key transit here. Uh, we have the United States natal chart and then Reagan's chart, and at this time, you have transiting Lucifer directly opposing his Neptune. A little bit of lack of clarity, perhaps, with regard to what his intentions are. That Venus that allowed him to speak and to be heard is square that opposition. So there's something about this entire piece where there's a sense of trickery going on in terms of what the ultimate result is. Let's move on to the next one here. And uh, on April tw March 21st, a couple of weeks later, Ronald Reagan signed Afghanistan Day. And um, in the, the uh, 
actual resolution, it makes reference to the noble freedom fighters of Afghanistan fighting the brutal totalitarian Russian regime. And during this time, we have this Jupiter Uranus conjunction in the chart, and the IC runs directly over Kabul. Uranus breaking free, Jupiter friendship and helping that homeland support for that land, and Uranus IC once again, an unstable result. So, what's the, this is only a couple weeks later, so here we have Lucifer at 24 degrees splitting his Uranus and Mercury and opposing the nation's Mercury. So you can see where Lucifer is continuously involved in this good versus evil. We got to keep moving here. Okay, February of 1982, Ronald Reagan takes Iraq off the list of the state sponsors of terrorism. On his lunar return, his ascendant is right here, and he's got moon midheaven and transiting north node midheaven, both running right over Baghdad. So here he becomes known for this. This is part of his instinctual need to take action here. Let's move forward. Ah, who's this? Handsome man. We know who this is. Who's this? This is Donald Rumsfeld. And on December 20th in 1983, they shook hands. They met. What can geodetics tell us about that event? Let's take a quick peek. Saturn, IC, Venus IC running on either side of Baghdad. To me, this just really quickly su suggests friendly authority. We didn't give them carte blanche, but we didn't tell them don't do it either. Both signatures are there. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, I want to talk real quickly about the coalition of the willing in the war against Iraq. Because once again, Ronald Reagan supported Iraq. Ronald Reagan supported the Afghanistan freedom fighters. That freedom fighter work in Afghanistan resulted in 9-11, and the help of the, uh, of, of with Iraq led to the war against Iraq. One evil presents a new evil. At this time, we have, this is George Bush's natal positions which we looked at a little bit earlier, favoring London, Spain, Italy, and Poland, the four main members of the coalition. And he also has some nice transits. But what I would really like to focus on are the other countries. Do we remember these other four? Remember this line? He didn't say it, but somebody else in his administration did. Let's try it. Forgive Russia. Ah, Venus ascendant. Ignore Germany. No planets within Germany. <laughs> Punish France, Saturn, Neptune crossing. This is a place of ultimate paranoia, being haunted. He hates the French. And so it's, so the point is, the point is, is that these geodetic lines really reflect, they're in the ground and they really clearly reflect what's going on. Let's do this last thing. Um, we had a presidential election, and I wrote a little article, uh, put it on my website, and I said that with the United States sun progressing into Pisces, that the country had a choice whether to embrace compassion or fear and irrational fears. And I felt that John Kerry would win unless the country embraced this sense of fear. And what we see here is very important that I don't have, I have to really do this quickly, but transiting Lucifer was over Crawford, Texas within two degrees from September 2nd through the election and beyond. There are some real questions here in terms of just the influence that that brought to our country. So, why don't we just go on and hopefully someday the Jedi will return <laughs> and Huey will strike back. And in the meantime, I would just like to say thank you for your patience. <laughs>